The podcast which you are about to hear is a look into the famous movie which covers the tragedy which befell a group of five youths, in particular, Sally Hardesty and her invalid brother Franklin. For them, an idyllic summer afternoon drive became a nightmare. That is right. Welcome to a brand new special episode of On Loop. My name is Lawrence, and I'm running solo today, which is weird, to say the least. <clears throat> this has been a hectic week, but I still want to give you all a new podcast episode. Um, everyone else is busy, so I was like, you know what? I'm going to talk about things I like. So let it be known to the listeners out there that I am a huge horror fan, and I will never give up the opportunity to talk about the films I love. Uh, recently, I've been getting into the, the Texas Chancel Massacre movies, and I decided to go and collect all the films. Like Within the past like week or two, I went and bought all eight films in the franchise, and I'm going to give them a watch through. And just last night, I watched the first one. And so I want to talk about the first one today. Um, And fun fact, which what I parodied, parodied, I apparently can't speak today. Um, What I kind of, not parodied, but I took a little snippet from the actual intro of the movie, which is like a scroll text. Um, So the part where you hear about like, which covers the tragedy, which befell a group of five youths. I just had a little podcast in there. Uh, So, please don't sue me. Um, But today, we're going to talk about Toby Hooper's 1974 classic, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And this is a fun movie. And once we'll get into it, you'll you'll see why I love this movie so much. Uh, This movie was directed and produced by Toby Hooper in 1974. And is based off a screenplay by Kim Henkel. I'm bad with names, so just bear with me here. And Hooper himself. Hooper even had a hand in the musical on signed Wayne Bell. which So, Toby Hooper did a lot with this movie. And at the time, he really wasn't known for much. He really didn't do much. So, the fact that he came and did this movie was kind of astounding. Um, our main actors, we have Marilyn Burns as Sally. So, she's kind of our main protagonist. Uh, Paul A. Partain is Franklin. He's in a wheelchair in the movie. He's Sally's brother. They're kind of like the main two people that drive this movie along. Alan Danzinger as Jerry. William Bale as Kirk. Terry McMinn as Pam. Edwin Neal as the crazy hitchhiker. As we'll also come to find, it's Leatherface's brother. Jim Seidel. He's the old man, the uncle. And then we have Gunnar Hansen. uh, The man, the myth, the chainsaw-wielding maniac, Leatherface. And I'm going to go, I'm going to talk about a lot. I'm going to keep saying it, even if you don't want to hear it. Gunnar Hansen as Leatherface is amazing in this movie. So, the main, kind of like the broken down plot of the film, is a brother and sister and a group of their friends travel into Texas to visit the place they grow up. During this trip, they become victims to a family of psychopathic cannibals that pick them off one by one. The movie itself, so these are just some kind of, some facts. Researchers out there don't scrutinize me. I got mainly my stuff from Wikipedia. So I was trying to make a quick script, and while Wikipedia is not the best for research, its facts are more than more than less there. Just kind of some stuff about the movie. The movie itself was branded as being based on true events that actually took place, but the movie in itself is mainly fictitious. It did take a lot of inspiration for from the crimes and things that uh, famous serial or infamous ser- serial killer Ed Gein did, that he was known for making like using body parts to make furniture, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Ed Gein is interesting to do to learn about, but he was a deviant. He was horrible. It was basically, like, the stuff they took from Ed Gein that went into the character of Leatherface. But that's as kind of all the real stuff goes. It says real events, but it was a fictitious story. And another thing which I also found interesting was, like, the film was meant to be a loose commentary on the changing political climate of the time. Watching the movie, I can maybe pick out a couple things, but I don't think I would have actually picked that out. But it also could be that I didn't grow up in that time period, so I wouldn't have an open eye to that much of stuff. The film was graphic, especially for the time, and this came with a bit of trouble to distribution and production of the movie. But despite those hardships as well as others they faced during filming, such as like long days and a kind of a small budget, Hooper created a genre-defining movie that's still wildly popular. The critics were split on the movie, but the fans are what gave the film its cult status. And it was still, it made a lot of money. It was highly uh, profitable. 
because they had a bun- budget of somewhere between 80000 and 140000 but it raked in over $30 million in the box office. I think it was, I think the exact number is like $30.9 million, which, especially for the 70s, is kind of amazing. The success of the slash film gave rise to several others in the wake, as well as a franchise of its own that currently has eight films, with another on its way. Uh, the, the new one is actually supposed to be a direct sequel to the original. They've tried that before, but this one's going to follow supposedly like old man Leatherface. And I'm kind of excited to see what they do with that. In itself, from the text Chancel Massacre, Leatherface, its main slasher, has become iconic and is even represented in several several other mediums like comics and video games. Uh, there was an old Atari game based off the movie. But I guess more modernly, Leatherface is a playable killer in a game called Dead by Daylight which is a game I've spent several hours playing. So let's break down the film, shall we? Let's kind of break down into, I say bite-sized chunks, but they're still kind of lengthy. That's just the writer in me that just likes to go on and on and on. But you know what? We're going to get through it. And I'll kind of like cover things I liked, didn't like. So the film opens with a text scroll introducing what the movie is about. And we get info from news reports that a string of grave robberies have taken place, but only certain bodies were taken. So like a one gra- grave robbery scene that maybe only took like fingers and legs or the skin of something or the bones. So they were kind of randomly taking things. And then we switch to that and we get our main characters. We have Sally, Franklin, Jerry Kirk, Pam, and they're riding through Texas in a van going to check on Sally and Franklin's grandfather's grave because they also heard about the grave robberies and they were like, okay, let's go check on our grandfather. We'll do that. We'll go explore the place we used to grow up in. One thing I can really say is I really love the characters here. I love, like, the acting. The actors did an amazing job. Each character feels at least distinct enough. And even though the actors at the time really weren't, were kind of, I don't want to say nobodies, But they haven't done anything big or even extensive, really. Maybe a small thing here and there. They all gave amazing performances. And, like, they really... They really matched the era they were living in. Which, sometimes movies don't capture the the eras they're from. But this definitely shows, like, its 70s roots. In our first major scene, the group decides to pick up a hitchhiker off the side of the road because the heat outside has apparently made them forget about stranger danger. But then again, it was also the 70s, so you know, free love and peace, man. Uh, the hitchhiker turns out to be one hell of a weird dude, though. Uh, and he goes on, he's talking all about the slaughterhouse and the old ways of killing them with the sledgehammers was better. Uh, we get a scene before the hitchhiker even arrived where they were talking about how Sally and Franklin's uncle, I think they were talking about, used to work at the slaughterhouse and how, like, they went from killing them with sledgehammers because it wasn't humane to now they use a bolt gun because it's somehow better. And, like, if you already didn't think the dude was nuts, he takes Franklin's knife, he just cuts his hand open, he's sitting there, he's just playing with blood. He's he's a weirdo. And my favorite part of this whole scene, though, is right after he does this, he, he hands Franklin his knife back, and then he just pulls out a camera and he just takes, a like, a super quick photo of them. Hands them the picture and tells them, he's like, okay, you gotta pay me two dollars now. Uh, cause it's a super good picture. And they're all just, like, sitting there watching this dude in amazement, like, and, like, they're all horrified, like, what's going on? Who did we pick up? And they hand him the picture, and he's like, when they refuse to pay, he basically just takes out a little gunpowder and just lights it up so it, like, starts cracking and there's smoke filling up the car. And this is the point they refuse to, like, go any farther, and then they kick him out. But before they can even do that, he, like, grabs his own knife, he slices Franklin on the arm, he jumps out, and as they're trying to drive away, he's, like, spreading blood on the side of the car, he's kicking the tires. Uh, As the van's, like, going, like, 0 to 60 in an hour, it's going, like, super slow. And I'm just stuck here wondering that the moment this man took the knife and cut himself open, why that wasn't when they threw him out. Like, it's just crazy to me. Edward Neal, as the hitchhiker, did an amazing job in this role. As someone who lives in the South, I've seen many a person like this, and it really unnerved me. His performance gave that creepy hitchhiker, like, backwoods vibe. 
and he definitely sets up the stage for creepy ass hillbilly cannibals. They eventually make it to the now abandoned house, where they walk around looking at the old wallpaper and share childhood stories. All while Franklin is let downstairs, where he starts complaining about the tree because everyone pretty much just ignores him and does their own stuff. We get some great mouth fart sounds, which are just pleasant. He goes on and on. He's talking about like. He's mocking his sister, like, oh, Franklin, come on the trip. It'll be fun. And he's like, if I have any more fun, I don't think I can take it. And then he makes fart sounds with his no- with his mouth. And that is, I guess, one of my major regrets with this movie. All in all, I guess the guy who played him did a great job acting annoying. But I really wish he wasn't as annoying as he was. And... I get like he was in like a wheelchair and stuff like that. They were kind of ignoring him, but he he was acting like a child. Um, kind of goes from that. He goes from like complaining. Uh, Kirk and Pam come down, and they talk to him about this water hole, and he tells them where it's at. So they go off to find the water holes because they want to go swimming. Which once they actually find it, it's dried up and it's drier than like a week old saltine cracker. There is not a drop of water in this thing. But, like, then like, they start listening as they're sitting there just laying down. And they hear a generator in their distance. And they go to check it. They go to check out the neighbors, ask if they can borrow some gas. Because a little early in the film, they check. They stopped at a gas station to see. To get gas so they can drive further out of town. But the place was like, nah, we don't have any. Take some barbecue, though, because, you know, barbecue is great. As we'll come to find out, that barbecue was not great. Uh,. But they come across this house where they're calling out for someone, but no one's answering. And if you're somewhere where you've never been, you don't just go to a random person's house, especially in places like where they're at. But he goes inside the house anyway, like he owns the place. Uh, his girlfriend Pam is just sitting outside. And... Because she's the smart one of the group. Like, she's like, I'm just going to sit here. I'm not going into some weird house where you're not. Or at least at the moment she doesn't. But Kirk goes in. He treks ahead. And before he's even able to go anywhere, we see, like, this frame from the doorway past the staircase into this room. On this wall, there's, like, covered in animal bones. And Leatherface, our first look at Leatherface, he comes out. And he's just standing there, like, looking at Kirk. And he smacks him upside the head with a large hammer. And we see his, like, we see Kirk's body just fall to the ground, just twitching. Just bloody and flailing. And then he's dragged away. And one of my major notes is, Gunnar Hansen as Leatherface really defines his iconic slasher. He is tall, large, and brooding. Like, the man reeks intimidation as he comes out of the frame with his dirty slaughterhouse uniform his unkempt hair and like and then his mask his grotesque mask is just it's another person's face he has just like sewn together over his as a mask and i think it's brilliant especially coming from being a horror movie antagonist that's horrifying to see somebody wearing someone else's face just run at you while he, like, Leatherface isn't my favorite slasher, he's probably by far the scariest one. Between having, Freddy Krueger's my favorite, just because I love those movies. But if I had to fight Freddy, Jason, or Michael, or Leatherface, Leatherface is the scariest out of all of them. Even if he may not technically be the strongest or have the most powers, he is the most daunting. We get a couple scenes later, Pam's like, okay, where'd Kurt go? And so she goes into the house, because she's not smart apparently anymore, and she's just like looking around, and this is when she notices a lot of the furniture is just made up of human and animal bones. Like, the chairs, and like, there's the table, and this is when she's like, oh, some dude's not right here, and before she can like, Scooby-Doo run away, Leatherface like, comes out, and like, picks her up and takes her back to, like, the meat room and hooks her up on, like, a giant meat hook, like, straight through the back. And I hate scenes like this because, like, anytime people get strung up on big hooks, I just, I cringe because I, the pain would be unreal as you just have this giant metal hook slicing through, like, your back and your muscles. 
it, ugh, I hate it, but also as a horror fan, like, I love that stuff. And then, like, as she's sitting there dangling on the hook, Leatherface, like, revs up his chainsaw, which is the first time we see a chainsaw. But despite this being Texas Chainsaw Massacre, there's not a lot of chainsaw going on to, like, the near end. But this is cool as he, she's just dangling. He's sitting there carving up uh, Kirk. Uh, I guess preparing him for dinner later on. And uh, it's just great. And then where Jerry, one of the other people, comes to try to find Kirk and Pam. But he's also kind of killed by the leather face. Because he also goes in the house. Because no one in a horror movie never actually thinks, Oh, I probably shouldn't be doing this. I probably shouldn't be going to this weird house by myself. But they do that anyway. And, like, he comes across this giant, like, freezer. He opens it up. And we get a really good scene where, like, the barely sentient or barely conscious Pam kind of, like, rises up. Leatherface comes in all disgruntled, like, slams the freezer shut. He grabs Jerry and pretty much and kills him. And one of the things about this movie is once it gets going, it doesn't stop. Leatherface and his family terrorize these people in an amazing display of, like, psychotic joy. And let's talk about a little, little bit more about Leatherface. He's got almost the personification of a slaughterhouse. He is that large, crude version. And he's just always wearing the product on his sleeve and his face. Uh, you see what I did there? Yeah, you see what I did there. But, like, think about an old-timey slaughterhouse. Just disgusting, smelly, flies everywhere, bloody. Take all that and wrap it into a person, and Leatherface is, like, the horrific idol of that. And this is why I believe he's an iconic slasher. And, like, there's nothing supernatural about him, but instead he's just a large brood of man without a lot going on in the brain department that's just like, I'm gonna do what I like to do. Kill and... Basically, kill and cut up people. But the last main bulk of the film, because at this point we only have two characters left, we have Sally and Franklin out of the Survivors. And so they're trying to find the rest of their friends. Franklin doesn't want to hang around, like, the van by himself. So he, like, forces Sally to push him through, like, weeds and down a hill to go try their friends, even though it's a big inconvenience. And he probably could have survived a little longer if he didn't go. But Leatherface comes out of, from the shadows of, like, bushes. He, like, lunges at him and just goes to town on him. He's just sitting there with a chainsaw, slashing back and forth, in and out. He's just, he's making, like, wood art with this dude's torso. All while he can't run away. He's stuck in a wheelchair. And then screaming and, like, definitely um, not terrorized, but definitely, like, traumatically shocked at this point. Sally still gets away with Leatherface chasing her through his house. Uh, make He makes sure to car up the front door and a couple walls in the process, though, because, you know, horror movie villains, they have to give the person a chance to escape. And then, like, there's this cool scene where, like, Sally runs into a room pleading for this guy to help her. But she realizes way too late, like, the man is just a corpse. He's just, he looks like a dried up piece of dog, like, dog crap. If you've ever seen that, just, like, the white husk. That's basically what this dude looks like. She turns around and there's another skeleton there, probably his wife. And then, like, a couple seconds later, Leatherface has come back with this chainsaw. And he's just like, we're gonna do it. We're like... I'm going to murder you. You're going to be Sunday's dinner. That's just how this is going to be. But in a desperate attempt to flee, Sally jumps out a second story window. She makes it back to the gas station where they briefly visit at the beginning of the film. And she pleads for the owner to help her, but he's a part of the, like, sickness going on. And he knocks her out with, like, a broomstick. Which is, like, he breaks a broomstick over her back and he just sits there and, like, pokes her with it until she, like, passes out. And he puts her in a, uh, like, a gurney sack. And puts him in her truck so he could drive her drive her back to the family house. Because at this point we get to realize there's pretty much as a whole. This is the cannibal family. Um, I'm pretty sure he's like the uncle. That's what they say in the film. If I remember right. The hitchhiker from earlier is uh, Leatherface's brother. And so they're just this happy, this happy family. They're all just sitting there talking about the lovable meathead Leatherface. He gets scolded for like breaking the door. But at the end of the day, they just start to set up for dinner. And uh, Grandpa's also back. So that dude I was talking about earlier, 
the dude that looks like a dried up piece of like dog crap or like a nasty piece of ancient chalk. He's there because apparently he's alive. And like you just get this like picture of the happy family while Sally's sitting there crying and struggling. <laughs> and like they sit down to have dinner with Sally tied up to a chair, like trying she's trying her hardest to get free. And in like a really weird scene of the film, they like cut open her finger and they just let grandpa like suck the blood up. He's just in there like nomming on it like a juice box. And I'm like, okay, somehow this dude's alive. Not gonna question it, you know? That's a movie. Uh, that's probably the most supernatural thing about this movie. And then, but then they, they go even further. They make it a point. They say it a couple times to make it known that Grandpa's the best killer out of all of them. That's what I want to question. I don't understand. Maybe in his youth, maybe. But no way is this dude who's basically two steps from a coma, from dying is going to be able to, like, be the best killer out of all of them. Especially when you have a large brute with a chainsaw. But anyway, they, like, set Sally up over this, like, metal tin, because it's, like, the blood collector. They give Grandpa the bonk hammer to, like, bonk her over the head. But he keeps dropping the damn thing. And they keep putting it back in his hand. They're all of a sudden, they're, they're taunting, they're laughing. Like, Sa Sally just ha has to be traumatized. No one would get out of this without being traumatized. She does use it to escape. One thing I'll say about it, like, especially in this scene and throughout this movie in general, there's great cinematography. It cuts between, like, the family and Sally struggling. And then there's, like, this close-up on her eye that just gets, like, closer and closer. And so you see, like, the bloodshot eyeball. And it's just, it's just well shot. But, like, I said earlier, like, Grandpa still keeps dropping the hammer. Sally uses that to escape. And she jumps out yet another window. I I get it was the fastest route, and if she tried to run to the door, they'd probably catch her. But jumping on these windows is definitely hurting her, because she's, like, limping away. She gets to the road, but the hitchhiker and Leatherface, they're right behind her. They're only, like... Even at one point, he the hitchhiker grabs Sally. But thankfully, a semi-truck comes out of nowhere and just pulverizes this dude. He pulverizes the hitchhiker... So, cue the Alice Cooper song under my wheels, because, like, he gets obliterated. And then, like, sh the guy, like, opens, the truck driver opens the door, lets Sally in. Leatherface is sitting there with a chainsaw trying to hit the door. All he's doing is, like, maybe putting a little dent in it, scratching off some paint here and there. But then, like, they climb out, and, like, we get a scene where it's, like, he grabs a wrench and throws it at Leatherface, and that's enough to knock him down. Which, also, I don't think that's going to work, seeing how large Leatherface is. Even though it's going to hurt, I don't think a pipe wrench is knocking him down. But, he does get a taste of his own medicine, as, like, the chainsaw comes back on him, takes a small but meaty chunk out of his own leg. And, like, he screams in pain, but a second later he's back up on his feet anyway. We see the driver, the truck driver, just running down the road. He is definitely getting caught. Like couple seconds later that family was gonna go after him and kill him even and then that's bad for that dude but like another truck comes down the road sally jumps in the back and like they drive away into into safety i guess into the night probably to the nearest police department which in this case i feel like this was it was a uh, deus is machina so like something that comes it's usually not well implemented. Something comes at the very last moment to save the, um, like, to save the, the protagonist from the antagonist. But I think, like, the fact that they're just out on a road anywhere, there's gonna be trucks and people passing by quite often. So I felt like, in this sense, it actually really worked. And then we just end the movie with Leatherface and they're flailing his chainsaw around. And just screaming defeat. And that's the end of the movie. Oh, quick side note. One part I forgot about the dinner, which was also great, was Leatherface was now dressed up as a woman when he was, like, serving dinner. He had, like, like longer hair, and he had, like, a woman's face on, because you could tell by, like, the really bad makeup. He had, like, blush and lipstick on. It was, it was honestly kind of funny. 
and he was playing like the homemaker the way he was like setting dinner and he was acting with like more feminine touches but that is the texas chainsaw massacre and this movie is just great man i had watched this movie when i was really young and i didn't used to like it i remember not liking it at all i found it boring i thought it wasn't that good compared to other movies at the time or like during the time that it this came out but then like i've watched it more and more over the years and understanding more about film and horror, I've been able to see just how great of a film this is. The story was great, and it's still one of the best stories about a cannibalistic family that's been made. And the movie encapsulates the error, and it serves to make an amazing horror film. And this is further strengthened by a score that plays up the tension and the anxiety of the characters as they face the things they're pitted against. Like, and as I said earlier, Toby Hooper also had a hand in doing the music. And this just shows that he was he was well-rounded in what he was able to do. This movie really shines in its characters and cinematography, though. The cinematography is shot with, like, these simple shots that carry forward the tone of, like, helplessness, decay, and kind of like a breakdown of rural life. It's like the stereotype stereotypes of, like, rural life taken to an extreme. And there's no shots that are, like, super complex... And it's all real simple, and I think that adds to the touches. And one of the things that makes this movie as scary and unnerving as it actually is. And, like, every scene with Leatherface is a treat. He comes out, he's this looming figure, and Gunnar Hansen brings this monster to life. His actions and his demeanor and his performance just makes you actually think this dude is, is real, and he's coming to kill these people. And he, that even goes further. So the rest of the family was also played with like a darkly comedic tone. But like while not serious in nature, it made everything that much more unnerving. As they're sitting there, they're laughing about all this pain. They're just playing it off like it's a big old joke that this is their normal. This is their normal everyday stuff they do. They kill people, they torture them, and then they eat them. But the survivors weren't around long, but they did feel unique enough. I will say like... I maybe would have liked to see a little bit more, more in general. I would like to maybe see more, uh, more of Leatherface, more of these people trying to survive interacting with them. Because once Leatherface did interact with them, they were pretty much dead seconds later. But on the other hand, that also does go to show just how menacing this dude is. And just how scary he actually is. He's not letting these people get away. Franklin was annoying though, I will say that. I would have maybe liked it if his childish attitudes played down a bit. But it does go along with his character traits, and it does boost that performance. Sally is an amazing final girl, though. And what a final girl is, it's like basically the term of the last heroine in the movie that usually escapes and wins against the killer. So like Nightmare on Elm Street, it's Nancy Thompson, played by Heather Langenkamp. So on one hand, she felt kind of like down to earth, a bit of a damsel character. She was kind of ditzy. But she eventually came to fight against everything and still get away, but all while not appearing as a badass, as many horror movies turn their final girls into. She was still vulnerable, like, at any second you thought she could still probably die, but she was still able to use her, everything to her advantage to kind of, to escape. And she didn't let the odds get in her way, and I can commend that in a character. I feel like that just, it's kind of like strides. It's like what a horror movie, horror movie final girl can be. It can show that they're still strong without turning into a badass all of a sudden. I guess that's basically kind of the end of my review. Uh, this is the first of my more solo movie reviews, kind of uh, anal analyzing projects that I would love to do more of so I can hopefully get better at it. Because if you cannot tell, I'm kind of all over the place right now, but I'm trying my best here. And I want to get more in-depth and actually do more of analysis. Right now, I'm kind of doing just like a strict review. And I'd like to get on a deeper level with films I love. Uh, I guess before I ramble on even longer, I just want to say my final like, my final thoughts. That this movie, it's an iconic horror film that any horror lover should watch. And just from a film standpoint, this is one people should just watch to have a wider appreciation for filmmaking in general. Leatherface is amazing, and 
I can't wait to see where the rest of the franchise takes me. I've seen one or two of the other ones, and I know I really like them. But I've heard some really bad things about a couple of the other ones. So I'll see how I feel at the end of the franchise. But I give this movie an 8 out of 10 chainsaws and grandpa hammers. Because I think it is that good, in my opinion. So if you like what we do here, uh, make sure to check out our podcast and on everywhere. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Radio Public, Breaker, um, our main site, Anchor. You can, we also upload these to YouTube. And if speaking of YouTube, we also do gaming videos. So check us out on YouTube at For Loop or on Twitch where we go live a lot at The For Loop. You can also find us on Twitter at The underscore For Loop. So just come, check us out on social media, follow us, keep in the loop with everything we do, and yeah. Um, my name's Lawrence, and this is, you're listening to For Loop. This is the All Loop Podcast. Bye.